This is Think Tech Hawaii. Community matters here. Aloha and Meli Kalikimaka. And instead of today talking about this cannabis, this dear old beautiful plant that we have talked about for the last year and a half, the plant that's a 10,000 year, that we know of anyway. Today we are going to talk about one of those things that an industry like cannabis needs to exist or to exist better. <laughs> we have a new best friend, and you know I only talk to best friends, and this is Michael Sang. Hi, pleasure, nice to meet you. And he is the CEO of Super Processor. That's right. And for all of you that are working in the cannabis industry, this is the man you need to know. They are the first company to provide credit card processing for cannabis services in Hawaii. <laughs> that is so necessary in a cash business. Mm -hmm. So tell us about Michael. Um, I'm five foot ten. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm short, I've, so. I've, I've been in payment processing for about 18 years. Uh -huh. So the payment processing space, I've seen a lot of changes from 18 years ago when we were still phasing out of just imprinting credit cards and mailing them in for payment. Right. Which is pretty crazy when you think about it today because everything is so in the digital virtual cloud world. Um, and uh, I've been really passionate about solving problems in the payment processing world for, for years. And 10 years ago, the cannabis industry crossed paths with myself and I had a regional salesperson come to me and say, hey, these guys, these customers of ours in, out in Oakland, they want to meet you because they have a problem and they think that you can solve it because you're kind of an out of, out of the box kind of, kind of guy. And I said, I said, sure, what do they do? They said, they're in the cannabis industry. I said, what's cannabis? <laughs> <laughs> yes. so, so that was, a, that was the pivotal moment that I said that, that marked the milestone of the point of no return mm -hmm. because they, they showed me their dispensary out in Oakland they said they have this problem that they see, this is 10 years ago, you know, so now today, fast forward today, it's been a 10 year old problem. So they said, we have a, a problem that we see that's coming upon us that it's gonna become all cash. And back 10 years ago, there was still gray area credit card processing, dispensers still getting credit cards, but without being shut down uh, officially. And so then we spent time figuring it out and it was quite a journey. We can talk about many different twists and turns <laughs> So, so you do all those things that make it happen that we don't, we just slide the card in sure. and something happens, right? There's a lot that happens behind the scenes. Yeah, so yeah. you're one of, you're the, the CEO of the company that does all of that that we don't see. So when you swipe your credit card, it, right. it touches our servers, it touches the card associated network like Visa, MasterCard, American Express, and then it goes to your bank right. that issues their credit card. And it, this is full circle, full circle that happens, and many companies are involved in that one split-second transaction, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, and all these and it employs so many people in the behind the scenes because of that one transaction. One transaction, mm -hmm. yes. Now, so this is cannabis is a because of the feds. This is a cash business. So, can you explain to our audience what it is that the feds are objecting to that you can't use a credit card or a bank account or insurance or whatever? <coughs> well, uh, first of all, cannabis is on a Schedule 1. Mm -hmm. uh, which is ridiculous, which but is, okay. Which is ridiculous, absolutely. So, But it's there. it's there. You can't do anything about it at this point until it gets overturned. And the states have its own individual rules about whether what the position on cannabis is. So it's always been a state versus federal. Mm -hmm. And the same goes with banking. The, the issue, the challenge that the banks and the credit unions have had is that who insures the banks? FDIC, which is federal. Or federal. And then you have the NCUA, which is federal. And then so that touches upon this a very sticky area of federal versus state of 
what's actually allowed. Then um, it's really, uh, to sum it up, it's really the financial institution that has to take the risk really to say, I'm going to get behind this. I know I might get a slap in the wrist or maybe more, but because the state level is allowing this, me as a financial institution in that state should be able to, should be okay. Um, so it's not a very black and white message from the federal government on what will happen to the, uh, the local financial institution. It is black and white, this so will punish you if you do this, but there's not really um, an official but what, action. <laughs> okay, because of stage rights, it pains me to say, oh, pains me to say that. But anyway, yeah. <laughs> stage rights. So the state made it legal to have medical cannabis. Mm -hmm. So everything that's involved with that yeah. is within the guidelines of the state that's right. laws. Mm -hmm. So that the dispensaries can only service people that have the medical card. Right. And so they can only grow certain things that these people need. And all of this things that happen to make that industry move mm -hmm. is within the state. So they don't cross state lines, they don't do anything. That's right, no cross border. No. So it, because you'll be, it'll be considered money laundering and yes, all this other... Yes, all this <laughs> craziness, yeah. No, no, that's, that's really crazy. So then you come along and you say, well, we can assist you. Mm -hmm. We can build out a, what do you call it, a platform for them. Mm -hmm. that is generic or indigenous to the state of Hawaii and the cannabis. So the solution we have is not just for Hawaii, it's actually for multiple states across the country. And we, we had to find a few components. We actually found the first component a few years back in Hawaii, which is a sponsored bank, a bank that's willing to clear the transactions for the cannabis industry. What we didn't know is that we had to own the switches, the data center, because when we went out to the processors that are in the, in the market, they said, go find a bin sponsor and we'll let you then process using our technology. And we found out that that wasn't the case. We came back and said, look, here's our bin sponsor. Let us now help the industry. And they said, absolutely not. You can't use it. <laughs> and we were like, why? <laughs> they said, because we were just not allowed, allowing you to do it. And that became the case for every processor we came across during that time. And we had lost that bin sponsor three years ago and fast forward to today we found another bin sponsor and now we own that other piece which is the what do you technology. mean bin sponsor uh, so in order for a credit card transaction to be funded it has to have a almost like a clearinghouse where a bank has to uh, a bank or a financial institution has to clear those credit card transactions to fund it oh. so when you swipe your credit card there's a uh, bridge so to speak that is the processor and the financial institution that sponsors that transaction, every day they have to reconcile all the transactions and pay everybody. And it's, it's, a, it's a pretty crazy system when you think about it because of the amount of transactions that happen all day long. Yeah. Because I use a debit card and I can pay for something here, walk over to the bank, and it's yep. gone. Yep, that's right. That's fast. Yep. Yeah, walk across the street and the money's gone. And it's only going to get faster because there's real-time payments coming into the very near future that's already here where instant transfers are going to happen and payments even to merchants are going to happen faster and they'll have better cash flow because funds will be transferred right away instead of waiting. Um, but going back to the, the bin sponsor, the bin sponsor is very important because it's, it was very hard to come by. It, it mm -hmm. took us many, many years to find someone that would entertain it and then sign it and then get behind it and then put the proper compliance behind it because now they're whoever's regulating that financial institution has to be able to say, okay, these guys can do it because we're comfortable with them handling it based on federal regulations. Right, and past performance. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> past right. performance. Yeah. And we came across that in 2008 when the market crashed. We, we actually formed a, a bank just to try to solve this problem, and then the market crashed. Oh. And then we tried to buy a bank, and we saw these really horrible balance sheets on banks, and we couldn't find a good bank at the time to buy <laughs> What or could you create a a home, um, not a bank, but a savings and loan or something, credit union? We we've we've explored and tried 
various models, including an industrial bank. Many people don't know what an industrial bank is, but it has a, like a, it has a sole purpose for a certain business. And we, uh, industrial bank was the extent of what we thought could be close to uh, uh, becoming our uh, checking and sponsoring the credit card transactions. But we realized at that point is that it, it was better for us to go and find the bank and convince them and help them get to that point with, because they just needed help. Most, most banks or credit unions that were willing to do this didn't have the infrastructure or the resources to handle the compliance because oh. it was so heavy, the amount of work that they had to do, they didn't have the staff to really comply. So they, they were afraid of that. Oh, yeah, yeah. of course. Well, what now could you create um, a hometown bank or give it a different name, wouldn't call it a bank, like credit unions are devoted to certain people only? So there's an effort in that, and yeah. it, it failed because they were focusing on a credit union that was all cannabis. And back in 2008, when we were uh, forming what's called De Novo Bank, New Bank, we, we talked to all the regulators that we were immediately regulating the area that we were at, and they, they, we said, hey, which model would you support? If we did an all-cannabis bank, if we did a, a business bank that was friendly to cannabis, or various versions of that, and they said it has to be diversified. It can't just be a cannabis bank because well, it that would... that makes sense. Yeah, just uh, for, for risk reasons, for uh, getting your, your bank charter, it's, you're getting a federal charter. Right. So it's hard to say... I'm well, gonna, now, yeah. that, now that they have passed this hemp thing, the farm bill, yep. with hemp, you may sure. be, you can come back and try again. Yes, yes, absolutely. It, it's, it's quite an endeavor to start a new financial institution. It is, I'm and, sure. And we, we, we went down that route, and fortunately we're at a stage where we, we have the ingredients that we need to launch the solution to help the industry. But... I think starting a, a financial institution, again, is probably out of our wheelhouse. <laughs> no, the thought of that is just, I, I was just thinking what could be done because the amount of cash that is mm -hmm. turned over every day in this industry, mm -hmm. and I, I'm sure that people aren't feeling safe. It's, there's definitely a, a lot of liabilities. You know, we, my business partner in this endeavor, endeavor he co-founded Harborside, which is one of the largest dispensaries in the world. And he told me his very first payment that he had to pay to his local tax office, he had to carry $300,000 in cash. Where is in a, this? In a backpack in California. Oh, California. So he goes to his local tax office and said, I'm here to, he called ahead of time. And he says, I hear, I'm here to pay my taxes. And they hand counted oh. that tax payment. Three people had to hand count it for them to receive the money. <laughs> now, they, now they have bill counters. but. When they first started taking it, they they didn't they weren't they didn't realize what was going to happen. <laughs> well, it yeah, I did read that the state of California had to hire more people. Oh yes. Would we have? Do we the state of Hawaii? Will they have to hire more people to handle this? Because um, this dispensaries have been open a year now. I don't think the volume is there yet because California is very different compared to Hawaii. And uh, the volume has to pick up a lot more to, to make that more considerable uh, of an issue. And there are some forms of electronic payments today, so it's not completely all cash. And that helps a little bit. And once we roll out our solution, a majority of it should be in electronic payments because we can deposit into a dispensary or a cannabis-related business as long as they have a checking account. So um, that would be any of the people that are selling products that are not the dispensary, but they're selling products. Yeah, so they, it could be they're ancillary. Open, mm -hmm. They're open to you also? Yeah, we can, we can not just do dispensaries, but we can handle uh, ancillary products, any type of vertically integrated area which they're in, as long as they are compliant and they have their papers and, and everything else in order. We have a pretty rigorous underwriting process with the bin sponsor that we have, just because they already take checking accounts. They already provide service to the industry, the one that we have in, in California. So they're not new to the space, but the credit card processing is new. It's this next step they're taking to, to really help the industry. Okay, we need to take a break. Sure. And we'll be back in 60 seconds. And then let's talk about where we go from here. Okay, okay. great. Thank you. This is Think Tech Hawaii, raising public awareness. Choose to treat it with the help of a physical therapist. 
physical therapists treat pain through movement and exercise. No warning labels required, and you get to actively participate in your care. Choose to improve your health without the risks of opioids. Choose physical therapy. I'm Jay Fidel of ThinkTech. Come around every Tuesday at 2 p.m. with John David Ann and me. We're talking about history, history lens. Right, John? Exactly. Seeing current events through the lens of the past. Absolutely. See you next time. Okay, Jay, thanks. <laughs> Aloha. I'm Marcia, and we are back. This is Cannabis Chronicles, a 10,000-year odyssey. So we have... We are right here today in this new world, digital world, in that 10,000 year process. Mm -hmm. And we are talking to my new best friend. <laughs> and Michael has a, pro a company, he's the CEO of Super Processor. Mm -hmm. And they are on the cutting edge of the digital world and all of the cash that goes through the cannabis industry. Did I get that right? Yes, so it's one thing I wanted to add, I forgot to add this, but the, divi the division at Super Processor that handles the cannabis is called Viridipay. And Viridipay, Viridi means green in Latin. And that's how we created this division to handle solely cannabis. Wonderful. So yes, I didn't have that. Yes. Viridipay? Viridipay, V-I-R-I-D-I-P-A-Y, Viridi. Ready pay, green pay. Okay, green pay. Green pay. <laughs> Wonderful. So, does this take a lot of rooms and computers and all the kinds of? Sure. We we we. Uh, it needs a lot of data, like servers and data centers. We we uh, we use uh, data centers that process the transactions, and it needs a lot of technology. Software is a, is a huge component to our uh, platform. It, it requires a high velocity payment processing platform that can process many, 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 many transactions at a time. Okay. Do we have the students in Hawaii that are learning to go to work for you, that you are training in, that, in those skills? Uh, are we training people for that? We, we, we do. There are several initiatives that I'm aware of. Uh, there's uh, something called Dev League, that the founders of, of Dev League, there's, it's a school that trains, it's a, it's a boot camp that trains anyone who's interested in becoming a programmer in 12 weeks. Pretty, wow. pretty cool school. And uh, we, we, would source, we would source from there. There's also the universities that we went to HPU a couple weeks ago. We, we attended one of their um, competitions and, and fairs, and I was blown away by the tech talent that existed there. I was like, wow, these, these, these students are just at a different age than when I was in school. <laughs> oh, <yes. laughs> it's like unbelievable. Like, and we, we came across someone who actually had uh, a product that, they, that we were just blown away by the way that he was thinking. And we, we have a professional services division, and we have a CTO that uh, is, is our programming genius. And he was blown away by a student, and that, that said a lot to me. I was like, "Wow, this—it's pretty impressive that he's blown away by by the student there." <laughs> so we we have students now in high school, mm -hmm. are, and that are using all kind of technology. Sure. Mm -hmm. So do they move into this, or do they learn these tech skills in high school, or do they have to go to separate schools? They have to go to separate. Well, yes and no, because there are a lot of really, really great programmers who don't go to school at all, who just are self-taught. Really? And yeah, there's, I, know, I, know a hand, I know two handfuls of really great programmers that never went to school for it, but just they learn out of their own fascination and they just trial and error. And <laughs> well, okay, what, what I want, and I, I say this all the time, mm -hmm. I want this cannabis and the hemp, especially hemp, industry as an industry, not just a dispensary, sure. but a whole industry, so that our children can learn all of these engineers, architects, sure. all of this, so they can stay home. Yep. My sons all went off to college and they're still gone. Sure. Um, so, yes, I'm very selfish about 
Correct. wanting. That's why I'm asking you about these kids. Absolutely. Growing into this industry. Well, first of all, we we're we're building out the operations, our call centers, our support centers on the west side of Hawaii in 2019 to keep the jobs in Hawaii, and that's that's something different because the, the opportunities are somewhat limited for someone who's a programmer right. or a development, and we're gonna have more opportunities for developers to keep them at home. We 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 have a hard time like everyone else sourcing tech, tech uh, staff here um, and retaining them here because they do go off to other cities, unfortunately. Yes. <laughs> but but we're, 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 uh, I think we're one of the companies that are going to try to help with that to keep the jobs here because we have real initiatives to, to um, hire them because it's not just about uh, coming up with solutions and jobs for them to service Hawaii, but outside of Hawaii too because we have customers all over the country. It's not just, not just in Hawaii. And by, by that opportunity, it allows them to uh, have more opportunities in their, in their jobs and, mm -hmm. and be able to hire more people in the tech space. Oh, that, like I said, that's been my whole thing is that we need to take this and make it into something that our kids can grow into. Sure. Agreed. And, yeah. So where are you located? You said we're in Kapolei, oh, West Kapolei. Side, yeah. and, uh, and Las Vegas. So we're in two... Two areas, Las Vegas and Kapolei are two uh, home bases. <laughs> Vegas is booming, yeah. Yep, it's the ninth island. You, yes, you it is. Everybody's, everybody's, from Hawaii, everybody's yes. from Hawaii, yes. <laughs> <laughs> the food, <laughs> yeah. everything, yeah. So our data center is out in Las Vegas, and we co-locate here in, in the west side. And then the, the call center is where you call in for customer service. We'll be based on the west side here in Hawaii as well. Oh, I, I am really thrilled. The schools understand that this is where they can go. We we actually are working with some high schools to help them uh, uh, with some of their entrepreneur programs, and like Campbell High School is a good example. Oh, they're close yeah. to you. They're very close, they're close. to. They're in Kapolei. Yeah. They're, yeah. they're well, they're close to Kapolei, and we've been I've been sharing some time to help them with their students with some of their programs. So we're we're trying to think to the future because I think it starts at the root in the schools when the kids are young to help them on a path to, to, uh, to a, a career that they can stay at home, home or, yeah. or, or do something. Because you don't have to travel out. A lot, of people, a lot of people think that they have to leave Hawaii for the opportunities. There are a lot of opportunities here that they, they can keep them here. Yeah, well, that's like I said, that's especially with the hemp industry, which can grow into yep. who knows what. Yeah, yeah especially in Hawaii. And yeah, <laughs> and yeah, so that you have, you have even more transactions once mm -hmm. they get going. Yep, exactly. Or did were they just descheduled? They're descheduled. And hemp is descheduled. Hemp is uh, my understanding is descheduled, and that uh, well, it's it's allowed to you're allowed to do everything you wanted to do as a business person in hemp now. You can. It's only with there's the a, farm restriction. Build, huh? There's a restriction on how much you can build. I'm not that familiar with what the restriction is of how much, um, but you can. It's not. We can process credit cards for it now if we wanted to, because it's not. Uh, you know, the CBD is also, there's also places that does right. CBD at certain levels. Uh, we would also process for CBD transactions. Now, with CBD, can you open an a, a account at the bank? Yes and no. So the problem with, even though if you have a, a legal CBD business with the, the federal legal limits and you open an online store and sell CBD, a lot of banks, because they lack of education, they just cluster CBD with all cannabis. So if they flag your account for CBD, they say, hey, this is a cannabis business, we have to shut it down. So the CBD industry has had a lot of the same pains that the cannabis industry has had with banking, unfortunately. And that's true for a lot of the uh, banking solutions for the larger banks. Smaller banks a little more, uh, I think, easier because you can have a conversation with, with the uh, risk person directly or the, the, it's a, the risk alert. person, yeah, because yeah. <laughs> there's a risk person that they have these compliance. I hadn't yeah. thought about <laughs> the banks having a risk person. Yeah. yeah, so they have to make an assessment of what what's allowed and not, because then they have to answer to the the regulators, their uh, their bank regulator. Otherwise, they lose their charter. <laughs> oh my, yeah. Oh, so what do you? How do you educate the bank? Or like you said, you, at least with the small banks, you can. We used you to get do to that. Meet people. We yeah. used to do that ourselves. We we it was more more about compliance. So the banks had didn't have a compliance program for cannabis 
or cannabis related businesses because it, they just didn't they just never thought about it. never they weren't allowed to do it and it's because of anything new there's there isn't a precedent of how to handle it and then there's a question of money yes who's going to pay for it who's going to pay for the new policies that the, that that the banks need to handle those accounts and uh, what we did was early on we we helped share information. We were freely sharing information all the time with anyone who needed it uh, behind the scenes. But we, just, we were just interested in making sure that financial institutions, dispensaries would keep their bank accounts and we would say, hey, look at the escort case. Here's some anti-money laundering policies that you might be able to use and you know, use that as a foundation. And we would uh, help that. But today, what's great about today is there, there are several companies that specialize in, in these programs for financial institutions to help them so that they don't have to create and invest heavily in that, that division. Yeah. Well, I would think the way things are moving, especially with the states that are legalizing for recreation, that at some point the bank has to come on board. Yes. Well, there are over 400 financial institutions around the country who do service cannabis-related businesses. You just, you just can't Google it and find out who does it. <laughs> 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 you have to be in the know and be introduced, and then there's an the underwriting process. I've, I've seen on television that, uh, not television, on the internet, people selling shares in holding companies and different things like that. What, what is a holding company? A um, holding company is a company that holds the interest, the rights of it's the way I've seen it, the holding company can be used for many reasons, but the way that I've seen it for the cannabis industry is for the purpose of uh, protection. Because if you have a holding company, you might own the rights of uh, a dispensary, and then it might hold the rights for the vertically integrated part of it where they cultivate the product. Right. And they don't want to keep the rights w at the touching flower level because if something happened, then they can preserve the assets of the, of the company. It's more about shielding for protection on if something happens. So could the holding company have a legitimate banking account? Sure, so, the, so what a lot of companies have done to, in order to, to have banking accounts, they've created a holding company where that company doesn't touch the flower at all. Right. And it just becomes a management company to manage the finances of that company and the bank's okay with, with that as long as it's not touching the, the flower. Oh. Yeah. It's, okay. it's a little complicated. It's not the best way to do it because it's just, that has to be done the way it's done today uh, because it's, it's, it's following the rules. Yeah. Well, locally now, how much is an annual income from all of the dispensaries? Do you know? I don't Do know you have a number. sense of how much? I, it's not a public number, so I don't, I don't have a real number on that, so I can't, I can't give that to you. Yeah. I can probably query. I can no, 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 no. <laughs> I, I just wondered, you know, at what level does it make sense? I, I don't need to know their exact to make sense numbers. For, for what? That the bank has to say, look, at all of this money here, tax money, everything, we ought to have a part of that. At what point does the bank say? It's, uh, unfortunately, the cannabis industry as a whole is too small compared to many other industries. So mm -hmm. if, you, if you look at the total billions of dollars that the cannabis industry generates on, on revenue, there are companies that just generate billions alone. So when you compare, so the risk, the risk rewards is very hard for banks to, to, uh, to make that decision based on money, because they rather, they rather just not deal with it and yeah. say that we've, if something happens, we, we stand to lose many, many billions as opposed to this. What could happen? Uh, they can lose their charter. No, I meant yeah. what could happen that, you mean with the dispensary or something? Oh, you're talking about the banks, right? I was talking about the banks. Yeah. You know, why they would not want to, to uh, right. handle the business. All the local banks that, as far as I'm aware, all the local banks have taken a position to not bank cannabis because it's something called reputational risk that's very real for them because they have that, it's, every bank has a list of things that are risk, something risk. Reputational risk is one of those top uh, categories and this falls along the lines of rep reputational risk and then the regulators have to, they play a major part in that also. Mm -hmm. And uh, right now it's not a, environment where they're looking to do that yet. Hopefully they will. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Now, uh, what I would like for you to do is to look right over here in this camera and tell our audience 
that may want to have an account with you, because we have a lot of people that sell CBD and other sure. things. So tell them how they can reach you. Sure. So right over here. If you're looking for a merchant processing account, we're launching them in 2019. You can email me at michael at superprocessor.com. That's M-I-C-H-A-E-L at superprocessor.com. Can you spell that? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, super, S-U-P-E-R-P-R-O-C-E-S-S-O-R.com. Good. Thank you. Well, thank you. And you will come back. Yes. If you have me back, I'll, I will come back. Thank you so <laughs> much. And Meli Kaliki Maka. Aloha. We'll see you next time. Aloha.